I've, uh, I caught, uh, one time in, in New York State, I fished a Lake George, and I was on a pattern catching smallmouth between 90 and 100 feet of water. <laughs> I never thought bass would go that deep, but they did. The bait was down there, and wherever that bait goes, those bass are going. And uh, so my point in saying that is we get, we get into this scenario where, oh, man, it's 20 feet deep. They can't be that deep, you know, or they're certainly not going to be in 30. You know, when we get this, this mental deal where we won't fish deeper. But I'm telling you right now, if the bait is there, the bass will be there. Don't be afraid to get out into that 40 and 50 foot zone to catch these bass. <coughs> One of the keys to fishing in the big water is find multiple depths. Find habitat in multiple depths. And I'll, I'll explain this by telling you a story about another tournament I fished up on Lake Erie out of Buffalo this time. And I, there's, a, there's a long shoal that I found that had a, an abundance of spawn and post-spawn bass, big ones, the old kind that you could win the tournament with. And how I was fishing these on this shoal, the shoal's a long, kind of real gradual flat that, that came up, and right on the top it had some rock outcroppings. And these bass were crawling all over it. And, I was drifting tubes, uh, just three and a half inch smallmouth tubes with quarter and even eighth ounce heads, depending on the wind and, and how fast we were drifting. But I drift through these little bitty high spots and just pummel the smallmouth in 20 to 25 feet of water. Now, on the first day of the tournament, what happens? The wind blows 30 miles an hour. So we had uh, five to 10 foot waves out that day. What happens to 20 feet of water in big wind like that? It gets silty. It gets silt, it silts right up. And what does smallmouth do when it silts up? They do not like it. They don't bite, they don't feed in it. It shocks them. It's not an all the time. Sometimes you can catch them in that stained stuff if there's heavy enough bait in it. But what happens is that water will start to silt up in that 20, 25 feet of water and less. And uh, so what in that scenario, what I simply did was I located similar high spots that were out in 30, 35, and 40 feet of water. And those fish just simply move out to that deeper water and feed out in a little bit deeper water. Once you get over 25 feet, you get back into gin, crystal clear water. So that's gonna be the key. Wind is always your friend unless it changes that water color dramatically. Remember that in all of your fishing, like windblown points, windblown banks, it offers excellent habitat for largemouth and smallmouth, with the exception of when it muddies it up and lowers that visibility, and that always, usually always make it a negative. Uh, drift socks and uh, drift paddles, I, and I use my trolling motor in concert with them. My, what I want to do is when, when your wind starts really blowing, what happens is you start to get drifting so fast, like I said, that bait is hauling along the bottom, and you need to get it slowed down. Now, I run usually two drift socks out, one out of the front and one out of the back of my boat. And every boat's a little bit different. It, it has a tendency to drift a certain way. Uh, my bass cat has a tendency to drift nose forward with the wind behind me. And so what I have to do is I have to use those drift socks. I have one in front and back, and I use my trolling motor. And I constantly kick my trolling motor into the direction of the wind. So I'm on it all the time. And my boat will try to straighten out, and I'll, I'll kick it back and those drift socks are working the whole time, slowing my drift down 50%. I wanna get my drift as slow as I can get it in a lot of situations. So I use those two weapons to do it. Now, when I'm drift fishing, what you wanna pay attention to a lot is your GPS tracks. They're gonna tell you where the fish are and how you're catching them. 